What is Lexio Divina? I'm going to talk about the four steps to prayer. So there's four rungs of a ladder from Guigo the Carthusian. And he talks about this in light of the ancient Christian form of prayer called Lexio Divina. Lexio Divina. What is Lexio Divina? Lexio means to read, Divina, Divine. So this is what the monks call the sacred reading. And the sacred reading was the normative and fundamental way of Christian prayer. It tended to die out like the four senses of Scripture. Those two waning at that time are not accidental, I believe. But this ancient method of Lexio Divina really began to die out after the Reformation and especially with the Enlightenment. And it became scarcer and scarcer. Pope Benedict has been advocating for renewal of this ancient form of Christian prayer, Lexio Divina. In fact, I want to give you a quote of something Pope Benedict XVI said on the 40th anniversary of Dei Verbum, Vatican II's constitution on the Word of God. Pope Benedict on that occasion said that if Lexio Divina is effectively promoted, this practice will bring to the church, I am convinced, a new spiritual springtime. That's a pretty strong statement. And you can only say things like that when you're Pope. Right? You can't say that if you're just a theology professor. You can't say something like that and be taken seriously. But you can if you're Pope. What is Alexio Divina? And why does Pope Benedict think that it's a key catalyst for the new evangelization and the new springtime? You know, prayer and this ancient idea of Alexio Divina was understood by the church fathers. They understood what Lexio Divina was, and they talked about it a fair bit. Jerome talks about Lexio Divina. Augustine, Ambrose, Cyprian, Cyril, they all talk about it. And I'm going to talk about Guigo, who is a 12th century abbot who kind of synthesizes this method into four steps. But before I get to the four steps, I'm going to talk about how in the patristic period they looked at it largely as two steps. Very simple element of prayer. What are these two steps of prayer? It's as simple as the Texas two-step, I promise you. Right. Ambrose says, quote, We speak to God when we pray. We listen to him when we read the divine oracles of Scripture. St. Augustine, building on his mentor Ambrose, says, Your prayer is your word addressed to God. When you read the Bible, God speaks to you. When you pray, you speak to God. St. Cyprian says this, quote, diligently practice prayer and Lexio Divina. When you pray, you speak with God. When you read, God speaks to you. Pope Benedict XVI says this, the diligent reading of sacred scripture accompanied by prayer brings about the intimate dialogue in which the person reading hears God, who is speaking, and in praying, responds to him with trusting openness of heart. Notice in all of these quotes, we can just keep piling them up, that there's two aspects to prayer. When one prays, one speaks to God. When, on the other hand, we read scripture, God speaks to us. The normative way of Christian prayer is with scripture to take scripture out of the equation of prayer. You're taking God's dialogue in its normative fashion out of the equation. That is so significant. Prayer, and one of the great classic definitions of prayer is prayer is a dialogue with God. But without scripture, we end up with a monologue. People so often will go to the chapel and they need to hear God speak to them. And they want to hear God and they go to the chapel and they pray intensely. And they know they got to get really quiet. And they get really quiet. And they close their eyes even because they're trying to concentrate. And they're trying to block out the noise outside of someone cutting the grass. You know, someone's rosary beads hitting the pew in front of them. You know, I'm trying to pray here. I need quiet. I'm trying to hear God. And they get so quiet. They're trying to pray and hear God. And they wonder why they can't. Right? One of the greatest challenges in prayer is people don't feel like God speaks to them. I'll never forget when my son was very young. He was about the age of, I don't know, three or four, probably around four. One night, I was tucking him into bed, giving him a blessing, and then after I gave him his blessing, I saw that he was really sad. And his little lip started to quiver. It means he was about the ball. He just starts crying, his face all crinkled up, and the sad, sad face. 
And he's crying. I'm like, Joe, what's wrong? I, we read a story. You know, we brushed the teeth. We had dessert before that. We, I mean, we did the whole routine. You know, we nailed the whole routine at a nice, easy pace. I have no idea why he's crying. And he's a reflective child, as I mentioned before. And he says to me, Dad, God doesn't talk to me. And he was crying. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're at a spiritual crisis and he's four years old. <laughs> There's things that happen in parenting that you're not ready for at certain times. How do I explain to my son how he hears or doesn't hear God? And I asked him, why? What do you, what do you mean? God doesn't talk to me ever. I'm like, what do you mean, Joe? And I'm pushing him. He had heard a tape of the story of St. Francis and how God spoke to Francis from the cross in the San Damiano Chapel. And Joe had been listening to all the crosses around the house and he hadn't heard a thing <laughs> for weeks. And he had despaired that God would ever speak to him and he thought that he had done something wrong, that God wasn't talking to him, that God didn't love him. And that's what he said when I pushed him, why are you crying? God doesn't love me because God doesn't talk to me, right? My friends, this is the genius, the beauty, the gift that the early Christians understood the Word of God to be. They understood Scripture as De Verbum, as the Word of God, as a word spoken to us. One doesn't speak a word without expecting it to be received by another. To speak a word is to assume an other. To communicate is to assume someone who is the recipient of that communication. God's Word is a word addressed to us. It's a word of love. To neglect the Scriptures as the Word of God is then to neglect the fact that God has spoken to you, to me, to us. But that gets us to the challenge. How do we hear God in the Scriptures? Pope John Paul II in Nova Millennium Innuente, which is kind of his blueprint for the third millennium, and for the new springtime. It was kind of his, you know, John Paul II kind of as the coach. And he's telling the team, here's the strategy. Going into halftime, here's what you need to do going into the third millennium. And in that, one of the central aspects of that beautiful document that the Pope bequeathed, in a sense, a last will and testament to the church, going into the third millennium, Pope John Paul II said we need to seek the face of God. And how do we seek that face? Pope John Paul II said, quote, It is especially necessary that listening to the Word of God should become a life-giving encounter. In the ancient and ever-valid tradition of Lexio Divina, which draws from the biblical text the living word, not a dead word, the living word, which questions, directs, and shapes our lives. That's crucial. That's crucial. And Pope Benedict saw the game plan, and he's taking that page of the game plan, and he is magnifying it, and he's talking about Lexio Divina all the time. Indeed, we're getting ready as the church. There is going to be the Synod on Sacred Scripture. And it's taken as its title the last chapter of Dei Verbum on the Word of God. Scripture in the life of the church. And in the working documents for that synod, one of the primary motifs is Lexio Divina. The church is going to have as its marching orders from the synod and from the pope a renewal in Lexio Divina. But how are we to make this word a living word that is a living word and a living encounter with us? You know, the challenge to that, I think, is best put by the great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Ludwig Wittgenstein was a wonderful philosopher, especially of words, and you know, the meaning of language. He's kind of a linguist, a philosopher of, of linguistics, so to speak. And Wittgenstein made this observation once that I think is profound. You can't hear God speak to someone else. You can hear him only if you are being addressed. Let me say that quote again because I think it's profound. You can't hear God speak to someone else. You can hear him only if you are being addressed. What does Wittgenstein mean by that? It's what my son had discovered when he was four years old. The profundity of that statement. You can't hear God if somebody else is being addressed. 
what is meant by that? You can't hear God if somebody else is being addressed. What Wittgenstein is suggesting is that if we hear sacred scripture, the Bible, as a word addressed to somebody else, we won't hear God speaking to us. This is the secret of the saints. The secret of the saints is that they attune their ears and their hearts to hearing God's holy word as a word not addressed simply to Moses or to James and John or Peter, but rather as a word addressed to them. That's the key. That's the key. In Book 8, The Turning Point of Augustine's Life, he had heard Ambrose preach, and he had read the scriptures, some of them, before, and studied them a bit. But he hadn't converted yet. He had put it off. You know, that old line of, give me chastity, but not yet. But that wasn't the only element that was holding Augustine back. It was a key factor, as he says. But Augustine has some visitors, and they tell the story of St. Anthony, and how St. Anthony, this rich, young nobleman, who just gets this great inheritance, and he wonders what God wants him to do with his life. He's just got this tremendous inheritance, and he's a free man to do whatever he wants with his wealth, with all these estates he's inherited. And Anthony wants to know what God wants him to do. Anthony, this young man, wants to know what God's call is on his heart. So he immediately goes to the church, and there's a liturgy going on. And he goes, because in the church where you hear the word of God, because the Bible would have cost about the equivalent of $100,000 in that time. You know, and no one had their own personal Bibles. You had to go to the liturgy to hear the word of God. So he goes, and he enters into this liturgy, and he wants to listen. What is God's word going to speak to me? And what he hears is Christ encountering the rich young man and calling him to give up all of his possessions and follow him. And you know what Anthony does? Anthony becomes Saint Anthony because he hears that word not as a word addressed by Jesus to that rich man in the first century, but rather Anthony hears that word not as a dead word, but as a living word that's addressed to him. And he obeys and he gives everything away and follows Christ wholeheartedly and radically. And he finds a happiness that surpasses all understanding. Augustine hears the story and it tears him up. Because Augustine has means, he has this affluence, he has this success. And he has also heard Christ's call tugging at his heart. And he hasn't wanted to obey and listen to it and take that risk that Anthony took. So he hears how Anthony took the risk and it's killing him. And his heart is breaking. So he says at the end of book eight, I went on talking like this, you know, saying, how could these people do this conversion and I haven't? You know, and he says, I went on talking like this and weeping with the intense bitterness of my broken heart. Suddenly I heard a voice from the house nearby, perhaps of some boy or girl, children I do not know, singing over and over again, tole lege, tole lege, which is one of our models at the Augustine Institute. Take and read, take and read. My expression immediately altered, and I began to think hard whether children ordinarily repeated a ditty like this, any sort of game. But I could not recall ever hearing it anywhere else. I stemmed the flood of tears, and I rose to my feet, believing that this could be nothing other than a divine command to open the book, the book of Scripture, and read. And I read the first passages I chanced upon, for I had heard the story how Anthony had been instructed by the gospel text. He happened to arrive while the gospel was being read, and he took the words to be addressed to himself. And he heard, Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So he was promptly converted to you by this plainly divine message. Stung into action, I returned to the place where Olypius was, sitting. For on leaving, I put down there the book of the apostles' letters. I snatched it up and opened and read in silence the passage that my eyes first lit upon. And what does he read? Romans 13. And in Romans 13 it says, Awake, for the night is far spent. And it goes on, he says in Romans 13, I'll read the passage here briefly. Chapter 13 of Romans, verse 11. Besides this, you know what hour it is, how it is full time now for you to awake from your slumber. For salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is far spent the day is at hand. 
Let us then cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves cunningly as in the day, not reveling in drunkenness and debauchery and in licentiousness. Remember the quote, give me chastity, but not yet. Not in quarreling or in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. Augustine hears that word as a word addressed to him. In other words, Augustine hears God speaking to him through the medium of the Word of God. And that's what happened to Anthony. That's what happened to Augustine. And that's what happened to so many saints hearing the Scriptures as a word addressed to them. Because Ludwig Wittgenstein is correct. You cannot hear God if someone else is being addressed. In other words, you cannot hear the Scriptures as God's word to you if you think it is only a word to Moses, Abraham, Peter, James and John, and Mary. You will not hear it as a word to you. And you'll wonder if God loves you. So that, I believe, is the secret of the saints. Prayer is a dialogue. Scripture is an essential component. St. Teresa of Avila said, I would never go to the chapel for my prayer without a book for Meditatio. She was a mystic. Now, I want to talk about Guigo because he takes this method, this dialogue, this two-step dialogue, reading scripture, praying to God, and he breaks it into a beautiful, simple method that became the classical method for the Middle Ages. Guigo's classic work called A Ladder for Monks. Guigo's work, he wrote to a friend of his after reflection about the nature of Lexio, and this is what he says at the beginning. One day, I was engaged in physical work with my hands, the old Benedictine right, way of working and praying, working with my hands, and I began to think about the spiritual tasks we have. While I was thinking, four spiritual steps came to mind, namely, Lexio, Meditatio, Oratio, and Contemplatio. So here we have our next four. So, Lexio, reading, meditation, prayer, contemplation. Notice, by the way, prayer, oratio, is the third step. Contemplatio is the fourth step. I think that one of the great challenges that people find in prayer, they find prayer difficult, is because they're trying to reach to the higher rungs. They're trying to start with oratio and contemplatio, and they wonder why it's out of their reach. It's just out of their grasp. It's just so hard. It's because they're trying to start climbing a ladder at its top. Not something I recommend. You start at the first rung. And this is what Guigo says about it. This is the ladder of monks, by which they are lifted up from earth to heaven. There are only a few distinct rungs, but the distance covered is beyond measure and belief, since the lower part is fixed upon the earth, and the top passes through the clouds and lays bare the very secrets of heaven. Then he describes it. Reading, Lexio, is like a first foundation. It gives us matter for meditation. So what is Lexio? Lexio is the labor of reading the text of Scripture slowly and carefully and reflectively. One of the key words for Lexio is studiorum. The monks who dedicated themselves to studying the Word of God, to be able to read the Scriptures. So that Lexio is that careful reading. It's that careful reading of Scripture. Let me give you one example of this. In Psalm 1, it begins, Happy is the man who walks not in the way of sinners, who stands not in the counsel of the wicked, or sits in the seat of scoffers. If you meditate on it, if you do a careful lexio, what you notice is there's a threefold progression. In Psalm 1, verse 1, you move with three verbs. Walking, right? And then what? Standing, and then finally, to be at the seat of scoffers, to be sitting. So there's a deeper progression. And the rabbis who reflected on that said, look, it's one thing to walk by occasions of sin. It's another to stand and take heed and soak it in. And if you're seated, now you're ensconced with sinners. You're deeper in sin. And the key to reading biblical texts, especially the Psalms, I like to say, is by looking for, and this is going to sound absurdly simplistic and ridiculous, but it's profound. Sometimes what is most simple is most profound. When you read a verse of the Bible, you need to look 
for nouns and verbs. Nouns and verbs. Like my English professor in English 101, freshman year of college, Dr. Bowers taught us, get rid of all those adjectives Timmy told me and all those adverbs. A good sentence on solid standing is about strong, concrete nouns and vibrant, active verbs. And what you'll see is if you look for that, the nouns you're going to see in Psalm 1 is a river, a tree, a chaff, wind, roots, stability, leaves that bear fruit. And as you reflect on that imagery that the nouns give you and the verbs bespeak, that leads to meditation. And so as I think about this key imagery that the river is compared to something, and the righteous man who meditates is like what? He's compared to a tree. So if the righteous man is compared to a tree, what is he comparing to the river? There's a blank space that you have to fill in as the reader. Blessed is the righteous man. He meditates upon the Torah of the Lord night and day. He is like a tree planted by stream of living water, right? This living water. If the tree represents the righteous man, what does the river represent? The Torah. You've got to draw out that connection. It's the word of God. So the river is the word of God. The tree is the person who meditates. It's the person of prayer. And the person of prayer is rooted next to God's word. So the righteous man is the person who prays. The person who prays. And the river is God's word. And notice that Psalm 1, which begins the five books of the Psalms, begins with a tree with a river. What does that remind us of? Because now as I move into my meditation, what's my meditation? It's my mind reflecting on this careful lexio. So in the lexio, I see the key things I'm going to focus my meditation on. And as I think about, why is the tree a metaphor for life? In the Jewish context, what does that reference? What does that connote? Fruitfulness, but what else? Where in the story of Scripture do we find a tree next to waters? The Garden of Eden. And what I realized then is through a life of prayer, I have access to Eden. So a life of prayer gives me access to Eden, where God dwells. And what's a good image of that? That makes me think of the temple. As I'm meditating, I make connections with Scripture, I realize Psalm 52, Psalm 92, all mention how the righteous man is like a tree planted in God's temple. Well, that's an odd thing. The idea of trees planted in the temple. But if you read 1 Kings chapter 6 carefully, you would notice that Solomon, in all the walls of the inner sanctuary, had carvings of trees. Why? Because the temple was the new Garden of Eden. And what's the greatest image of that? Who guards the Garden of Eden at the end of Genesis 3? Two angels. What angels? Cherubim. Two cherubim. Where else in the Bible? Only two places do you see two cherubim. Psalm 63. Like your wings in the sanctuary that I see that protect me and hover over me. Over the Ark of the Covenant were the two cherubim with their outstretched wings. So the fact that there's two cherubim in the inner sanctuary of the temple is to remind any Hebrew who's read the story of the two cherubim that guard the Garden of Eden. In other words, the temple is the new Eden. And so now that leads me to a meditation on prayer as encountering God as a sanctuary, as a new Eden. And then as I pray about that, it gives me a desire to be close to God, to have access to God, to encounter God. And so now in my oratio, I ask God, God, I want you. I seek your face. In fact, the Hebrew word for face is usually translated presence. I seek your presence. Right? As the psalmist says in Psalm 63, I long, my heart faints for you. I look for you in the sanctuary. And I contemplate your glory and your power. And then this is where I dialogue. See, this is where I start a conversation with God. If you define prayer simply as conversation with God, and you don't have these first two steps in, people find prayer very challenging. Why? Because if I sit you down with somebody you've never met before, and I say, have a great conversation, are you going to have a great conversation? No, the conversation kind of starts a little slow, right, when you first meet somebody, and then you find something that you share in common. 
And all of a sudden, the conversation picks up intensity. And as you share that intensity of something in common, then all of a sudden, wow, you start sharing a lot more. Today, I met somebody I'd never met before for lunch. And we found out that we shared something in common in terms of we both have one child and we both adopted. And we started sharing our adoption experiences and they had all these parallels. And it led to this incredible intimate sharing and the beginning of a great friendship. But the conversation starts off slow until you find that common ground. Well, what happens is people want to talk to God when they don't have something in which to talk to him about. Notice what is the key to conversation? Having what? A subject. Having something to talk about. What Lexio and Meditatio does is it gives you something to talk to God about. That's what Lexio and Meditatio gives you. And that feeds prayer. This is what Guigo says. Listen to what he says. Reading is like a first foundation. It gives us the matter for meditation. Meditatio seeks more diligently what is to be sought. It is like digging that finds a treasure. It's a reference to Matthew 13, 44, for those who have ears to hear. And digging finds that treasure. And so we are led to prayer. Prayer raises itself up with all its might toward God and pleads for the desirable treasure that is sweetness of contemplation. In other words, we dig in Lexio and find the treasure, and that treasure gives us a deeper desire for the deeper treasure that we seek and ask for and talk to God about. And then that treasure through contemplation is given when we taste and see the goodness of the Lord. And notice that meditation engages primarily the mind, the intellect. Contemplatio, and this can be controversial for a lot of modern-day Catholics who are reacting against a lot of liberalism of the 60s and 70s that talked about experience. You know, catechesis was hijacked by this experiential catechesis. And the focus became away from God and on a man. But we don't want to overreact against that and throw out emotion and experience. And there's a danger to do that because in all the ancient writers about contemplation, the key element here is experience. And the experiences of joy, peace, a deep joy and a deep peace. And also, and most importantly, the experience of love. Of loving and being loved. That is the first step of contemplatio. And people think that contemplation is some otherworldly mystical experience. And that might be at the higher rungs of contemplation. But there's baby steps of contemplation. And contemplation is something God intends for all of us. It's not reserved for an elect few. Contemplation is something God desires for all of us. And it's an experience of what the mind reflects about the truth and beauty of God and what the heart seeks and erodes you with desire is something we begin to experience in God's answer when we experience God and we encounter him and we see his face. Or as St. Bernard says in his beautiful commentary on the Song of Songs, he says, we touch God's hand with the hand of faith and we feel God's love with our heart. That's what contemplation does, according to Bernard. Right? It's that encounter with God. That encounter can only happen through faith and by the means of love. But it's available. But notice that this is the fourth wrong. And so many Christians go through an early conversion or a livening of their faith. And they want to pray. And they want to go in there and they want to start talking to God, but they find talking to God very hard and boring. And then they also found they want to experience contemplation, but they're trying to start at the third and the fourth rung rather than the first two that build the steps to get there. If you neglect the baby steps, you can't run before you walk. And that's why this method that was so inculcated and taught to all Christians is a dominant part of the Catholic tradition. For us to lose that method, this is why Christians have gone crazy with amnesia of losing the tradition. And so they go to the Buddhists, they go to yoga poses, and they try breathing to figure out how to get to contemplation. Because we've forgotten what our faith teaches us about how to find God and how to pray. And it's precisely that method that created saints. You know, Guigo himself became famous after he died as an abbot. Many of the local people in the village would come to his grave to pray and ask for his intercession. But his grave was in the courtyard of the monastery, so they'd have to come and knock on the doors. 
And pretty soon there was people who were being healed and miracles were happening. And it, it became famous. It went beyond the village. It went to the nearby villages and the nearby county. People found out that Guigo was a powerful intercessor. So people would come in all hours of the night and bang on the doors of the monastery. And the monks were losing sleep and they were getting aggravated. And it was interrupting their times of prayer and their times of sleep. And so the new abbot went to the grave of Guigo. And he said, I am the new abbot and you're under obedience to me. And I command you to stop performing all these miracles. And then not another miracle had happened. And Guigo's tomb. <laughs> right? But the point is, these four rungs, this ladder to heaven works. And many people reach great sanctity simply through a life of Lexio Divina, a life of prayer. Through that life of prayer, there's so much to say of all this. Let me quote Pope Benedict again on this. Pope Benedict says this, Among the fruits of this biblical springtime, I would like to mention the spread of the ancient practice of Lexio Divina, or spiritual reading of sacred scripture. It consists in poring over a biblical text for some time, reading it and rereading it, as it were, ruminating on it, as the fathers say, and squeezing from it, so to speak, all of its juice, so that it may nourish meditation and contemplation, and like water, succeed in irrigating life itself. The Catechism and David Rubin say that Scripture is a font of the spiritual life. Here Benedict uses that imagery and says that we can irrigate life. This is the spiritual irrigation method. If you've ever traveled much in Colorado, you'll see a lot of farmland. But you'll notice all the farmland in Colorado has something in every major farm field. What is it? A sprinkler system. They have irrigation ditches and lines and all these complicated legal things of water rights with these different irrigation ditches. You can't farm in Colorado without irrigation ditches that give you access to water channels that you then connect up to your hoses and your long, big sprinkler systems. You can't farm effectively. Pope Benedict is saying, here's our irrigation. My friends, we are planted in the desert of this world. And if you want to be spiritually irrigated, you've got to take this supernatural irrigation system of Lexio Divina. If you're going to be a tree planted by living water that will yield its fruit in its season, You've got to be rooted and planted by the living water of God's Word in prayer. If you don't dedicate yourself daily to that living water, to that living Word, because all of your study is simply, at the end of the day, a reflection and a study of that Word. But if you make that study only an intellectual pursuit, only an academic exercise, you'll miss the fact that that Word is a person. And then that word is a word spoken to you, just as it was to Anthony, just as it was to Augustine. And if we're going to bring a springtime to this world, we have deeply got to be nourished by that word. And we have to have the capacity to hear God's word as a word addressed to you and to me individually. And if we listen to that word and are open to the radical call and demands that word places on us, if we can overcome what Augustine had, and that was fear of obeying that word. He was terrified of the cost of discipleship. But if we can have the courage to listen to that word and let it shape us, God can do great things in you and through you if you just laugh. That's our call. That's our call. The Catechism in paragraph 2560 says this, it is he who first seeks us and asks us for a drink. Reflecting on the woman in the well, Jesus thirsts. His asking arises from the depth of God's desire for us. Whether we realize it or not, prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. God thirsts that we may thirst for him. Finally, what I want to say is, if these four steps of Guigo become the classic model from the medieval tradition, and there's something that St. Francis of Sales adds to this, that I would add a fifth step, like an appendix, a little addendum. And I want to give you a quote from St. Francis de Sales on 
the importance of meditation, but there's a great danger in meditative prayer that he talks about. And he says this. This is in chapter 8 of Introduction to the Devout Life. Useful hints on meditation. St. Francis Sell says this. Above all things, my daughter, strive when your meditation is ended to retain the thoughts and resolutions you have made as your earnest practice throughout the day. This is the real fruit of meditation, without which it is apt to be unprofitable. Notice that, and then he goes on, he's going to warn, not only can meditation be unprofitable, but meditation, prayer and meditation can be dangerous. Why? Listen to what he says. This is astonishing without which it is apt to be unprofitable, if not actually harmful, inasmuch as to dwell upon virtues without practicing them, lends to puff us up to unrealities, until we begin to fancy ourselves all that we have meditated upon and resolved to be, which is all very well if our resolutions are earnest and substantial, but on the contrary, hollow and dangerous if they are not put into practice. You must then diligently endeavor to carry out your resolutions and seek for all opportunities, great or small. And then he gives examples of this. And what's his point? Francis de Sales is saying, look, when we meditate and reflect with spiritual reading on the virtues and on holiness, the danger is if we spend a lot of time reflecting on virtue and holiness, we begin to assume that we actually have those things. We begin to assume that we're actually virtuous because we've read so much about virtue. We actually think we're holy because we read about so much holiness in the Gospels and in the Bible and in the life of the saints. And we begin to liken ourselves as holy and saintly. And the fact is we've only thought about holiness and virtue, but haven't actually put it into practice. And that's where St. Francis says the next key step is resolutio or operatio putting this into operation, putting this into resolution. My spiritual director has told me for years about resolutio and I've got to do that in my prayer. And I was like, ah, you know, meditation is what's really important because I'm intellectual and I love, I have deep meditation on scripture because I've studied scripture for so long, for all my life, right? And so I get these really cool meditations that I thought I was really making progress in prayer, right? How's your prayer? Oh, it's great. I had this awesome meditation, right? But my spiritual director, knowing with what they had to work with, <laughs> knew that that was not the case, that it was quite far. And my spiritual director pushed me towards resolution. What was your concrete resolution in prayer yesterday? What was the day before? What was it last week? Are you putting that resolution into practice? And I wasn't. So what I did is I found this moleskin. It's the old French ancient tradition of moleskin, which is a great little way of putting your notes. It fits in your pocket. I can put it in my support coat or my back pocket. Carry this with me. And in my meditation last year, about a year ago, last fall, I started to write down what my main point of meditation was and what my resolution was the day. And then after the first week or two, I started to look at my past resolutions. What was my resolution yesterday? Oh yeah, I didn't do that. What was the day before? Oh yeah, I didn't do that either. Did I do any from last week? Oh yeah, there's one day I did my resolution. I put it into practice. And that gave me a whole new perspective on myself on my life of prayer, <laughs> and on my need for God, and my complete emptiness. So I really recommend to you to pray, to do lexio, to do meditatio, to do the oratio, and perhaps you'll experience contemplatio. Sometimes you won't. That's all right. It comes and goes. As Bishop Finnell said, contemplation is where God carries your prayer. But it's like the sailor with wind. When there's wind, you let the sails unfurl, and you let the wind propel you. When the wind stops, then you go back and you got to do your own rowing back here. This is where you're rowing. This is where the wind's blowing your sailboat. Sometimes you'll have a few moments of this and you go back and you have many more moments of this. That's the pattern. They're not clear divisions. One flows into the next. But with resolution, get something like a moleskin. I have one color for prayer and another one for ideas and things of the day, to-do lists and ideas. When I listen to a book on tape, and I have an idea, wow, I pull this out, and that's a great idea. I write quotes and buy the one. So I find it very useful and helpful. So, resolutio is important, as St. Francis de Sales, lest we become ineffectual. As Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. 
And he goes on in the next course says, this will keep you from being ineffectual and unfruitful in serving Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that we've covered the five key steps to praying with Scripture, you might be asking yourself the practical question, where do I start? All of this idea about praying with God is so exciting and so inspiring. Where do I start? And I want to address some practical ways for you to start. The first thing is choosing a time that you're going to make this devotion to Lectio Divina to prayer. Pick a time. I like to do it first thing in the morning and that way it doesn't get crowded out by the other activities of the day. So pick a time, whether it's first thing in the morning. I like to get up before I even shower and I go downstairs, the house is dark, turn on the lights down in the living room and I start my Keurig coffee machine up and within 60 seconds I've got my cup of coffee, I go sit in my leather chair by the fireplace and that's when I start with my Lectio Divina. Now the question is, well where do I start in the Bible? And there's two places that I really recommend to start your devotion to praying with Scripture. And the first place is the Gospels. Nothing beats, there's no better place in all of the Bible to start praying with Scripture than the Gospels. Either Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Start with one of those four Gospels. In fact, the church says that of all of Scripture, the Gospels are, in a sense, the sacred heart of Scripture itself. So it's a great place to start. The other place to start with Lectio Divina and praying with Scripture is the Psalms. I love the Psalms. We have 150 Psalms and they're written as prayers to God that are inspired. And so it's a fabulous place to start as well. In fact, I think the Gospels and the Psalms are so important. That must be why the church, as a good Holy Mother, knows best how to teach us because the church gives us a reading from the Gospels and a psalm every day in every daily Mass. You know, you think of all the different genres of the Bible, whether it's laws or prophetic writings or historical writings or epistles and letters, the one key genre, or actually the two key genres that the Church gives us on a daily basis every day is the Psalms and the Gospels because those are the key to a healthy spiritual diet. Those are the kind of the the key nutrients, so to speak, spiritually that we need. And so the Holy Mother Church knows how to feed us well as a good mother. Now, a great place to find that is in the morning prayer or in the liturgy of the hours that the church has. And a simple way to do this is just go to the daily mass readings. And you can, you know, Google that and you can find daily mass readings, what's the reading of the day. But another fabulous way to do this is very simple and easy, and I love easy, is the Magnificat. Magnificat has a monthly subscription that has morning prayer and evening prayer, and it has the readings for the mass for each day of the month. And so, you know, if you get a subscription to Magnificat, it's really reasonable and cheap. Then you can get that nice little volume and you can put your Magnificat right next to your prayer chair where you're going to pray. And then you can open up and it says, you know, Magnificat for October or for May. And you say, okay, it's May 3rd. And I open up my Magnificat to May 3rd and bam, I've got morning prayer, which is going to give me several psalms and several readings from Scripture. And then I've got my readings for the day. And so I suggest that you just plan ideally 20 minutes to 30 minutes for your prayer time. Start with 20 or 15 minutes to begin with, but then work your way up over a few months to 30 minutes. That's a great time of prayer to do Lexio. And if you have that key place you're going to pray and you know I'm going to budget 20 to 30 minutes, then open up your Magnificat or the readings of the day, the mass readings of the day, and spend that time slowly reading and slowly praying through those readings of the psalm of the day, the gospel of the day, and you're going to have plenty of content for your Lexio, for your prayer time. It's just fabulous. Myself, I love to do the Liturgy of the Hours, and in the Liturgy of the Hours, you have what you call the Divine Office and Morning Prayer, and I do those for my Lexio every morning, and I also will use sometimes the readings for the day for my prayer, but the great, fantastic thing about this, I don't have to worry about what I'm going to use for my prayer time every day. I've got it set up by the church and I use the Divine Office app and so bam, I hit my app and it brings up the readings for the day and I have it and I'm ready to go. 
and I know what I'm going to use to pray for for the next 50 years, for the next 100 years. It's so easy. So you want to use that. It's a great way to go. The other thing practically that I really recommend is I like to have have a little writing tablet next to where you're going to pray. And I have in my reading chair where I pray every morning, I have a little moleskin. And it's a little pocket moleskin. And I open it up and I write down every day the date. And I write down what verse of all the verses I read that day that really spoke to me, where God was really speaking to me in a powerful way. And I write down that verse in my moleskin, and I want to try to memorize it for the day and carry it with me for the day, but then I also can always go back and remember how God spoke to me throughout the week, throughout the past month, and throughout the last year. And I find that to be a real treasure. And then the other thing I write down each day is my daily resolution. You know, we talked about the importance of making a resolution. I like to write down that resolution in my little moleskin. And then the next day, I look back and say, I put a check mark if I did my daily resolution from the previous day or a little circle if I didn't. And that keeps me accountable and it motivates me. I'm like, oh boy, I've been missing my daily resolutions this week. I really got to get on that today. And so I find that writing down your resolution and writing down and checking if you did it or not is a great practical tip to help you with your prayer and practical resolution. It's something that really helps me a great deal. And then I can kind of go over the last week and say, gosh, I am missing these daily resolutions and I really need to double down on it and really focus on making sure I'm doing them. Those are terrific things to do. So those are the real great practical tips I like to have. Sometimes, you know, I make a resolution during a liturgical season like Advent or Lent that I'm going to memorize that verse for the day and I'm going to put it on a three by five card and carry it in my pocket during the day. And that sometimes just is a great blessing and a real powerful tip. So find those practical things you can do. Again, make your place for Alexio a quiet place, a place that you have your Bible sitting right there ready to go or your Magnificat. And then, you know, I like to make it comfortable. To me, it's my leather chair right next to my fireplace. It's a comfortable place. I can't wait when I get up to sit in that chair, have my cup of coffee, and talk with God. And to listen to what he has to say to me in his word, and then I converse back. And it's such a powerful, powerful experience. You know, don't forget, don't forget in all the daily distractions how much God loves you and how much God wants to converse with you each day. Don't lose that time. It's so precious. It'll feed your heart and your mind, and it is just such a powerful encouragement to start each day with that prayer with God, that intimacy with God. It's a terrific thing to do.